Hi, this is Daryl Tano of Solutions Reservoir, and welcome to Cybersecurity and the U.S. Government, part two of our three-part cybersecurity tutorial. These videos align with more comprehensive and timely material on the Solutions Reservoir website. As before, pause on slides with yellow backgrounds to review reference material. In part one, we looked at the basics of cybersecurity attack and defense. Now we'll look at the participation of the U.S. government in the field. We'll look at FISMA, noting its establishment of security objectives, and mention some of the key organizations involved, such as U.S. CERT and NIST. Then we'll introduce some key standards and examine three of them, particularly SP-853. We'll close with introductions to FedRAMP and Trusted Internet Connections. Part three will focus on the Department of Defense. FISMA was part of the E-Government Act of 2002, which called for agencies to cost-effectively secure information types and systems to an acceptable level of risk. The Act assigned areas of responsibility and chartered NIST to develop foundational guidelines. FISMA also defined three security objectives, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, C, I, and A. We'll see a lot of C, I, and A, so we've added a reference slide on them. DHS is chartered with protecting the national infrastructure from physical and cyber threats. Its U.S. CERT arm plays a major role in the cybersecurity mission. U.S. CERT operates several threat-related databases. It also operates the NCPS, operationally known as Einstein, which is a government-wide IDPS. I think you'll find the U.S. website interesting and possibly a little unsettling. NIST, of course, is recognized for its fundamental role in cybersecurity standards development. Here's an org chart of DHS. Coming up are some important standards. In them, FIPS is Federal Information Processing Standards, and SP means NIST Special Publication. We'll put a yellow background on in a moment. Risk Management Framework, or RMF, refers to the process of qualifying, securing, and maintaining an information system. We'll see in Part 3 the term RMF is now also used for national security systems, which include DOD systems. Here are the standards for your review, and then we'll come back to the RMF. Begin the RMF process by looking at your community's needs and categorizing the potential impact of your IT system. Certain publications provide guidance for each step. Select the appropriate security controls as step two. Controls are operational or systematic measures taken to protect an information system. Recall from part one the example of a requirement to change your password as a security control. We'll address controls when we talk about SP-850. The RMF calls out six major steps, with step six being the ongoing state of continuous monitoring for SP-800-137. FIPS-199 provides guidance to categorize information types and information systems according to potential impact levels. It calls out three levels of impact, low, moderate, or high, as a result of a security breach, i.e. the loss of confidentiality, integrity, or availability. Impacts are low, moderate, or high if the loss of C, I, or A would have limited, serious, or severe consequences on operations, assets, or individuals. Security categories are applicable to both information types and information systems. And there's a format to express this, which will become more clear using an example. Values of these impacts will be low, moderate, or high, or possibly not applicable. Here's what we just had about information types and systems. For an information system, the value of C, I, or A can be low, moderate, or high. But for information types, confidentiality 
can also have a value of not applicable. Categorizing the security of a system is a two-step process that uses the concept of a high watermark in both steps. Here are categorizations of two information types within a given information system. Categorizing the system starts with categorizing impact values for C, I, and A using high watermarks for each, giving us the moderate, low, and high values shown here. In essence, we went down through the information types. Now we note the high watermark across the system CINA values. In this example, this is a high impact information system because the most significant CI or A impact value for this system, its high watermark, is high. Note that the high watermark yields a single value for system categorization. That value was high in this example. Technically, this single value notion is called out a little more in FIPS 200 than FIPS 199, but on this the two standards are tightly coupled. In part three, we'll see that national security systems do not follow the single high watermark concept for the system. FIPS 200 addresses selecting the security controls needed to satisfy the minimum security requirements. The main part of the FIPS 200 standard is only about four pages long. I view it as something of a bridge between FIPS 199 and SB 853. Of note is that FIPS 200 defines 17 security control families that are used in SB 853 and that you'll see all the time, particularly their acronyms. The following reference slide discusses FIPS 200's descriptors of the first three of these families. NIST Special Publication 853 is the fundamental reference for security controls across the government. It's the basis for FedRAMP and now even the basis for controls for national security systems, which includes DOD. As we'll see, SP 853 provides a comprehensive set of security controls applicable to FIPS 199 designated low, moderate, or high impact systems, but it's inflexible and offers guidance for tailoring matters to specific needs. Controls are grouped within FIPS 200's 17 families plus an 18th one program management. Here are the 17 families again plus the one for program management. 853 is a well-written document of some 450 pages. Appendices account for about 90% of it, of it, of which D, the summary, and F, the catalog, comprise about two-thirds. Appendix D has 19 tables. Table D1 defines prioritization codes. Table D2 a segment of which is shown here, summarizes 17 control families, and tables D3 through D19 provide further control details per family. Table D2, the summary table, is divided by control family in order, starting with access control. Here you see the control names and numbers of the first 15 controls within the access control family and our control baselines. Note the low, moderate, and high impact categorizations per FIPS 199 and the priority for each control. Let's look at how to use this table, looking at AC1 and AC2. For AC, we see that regardless of whether our system were categorized as low, moderate, or, or high potential impact, we'd implement the same basic AC1 control, which is defined in Appendix F. Let's contrast that with AC2. If our system were low impact, we'd only implement the basic AC2 control. But if it were moderate or high, we'd implement a number of additional subcontrols, which are also defined in Appendix F. And that's how it goes each control family. In the next slide, we'll look at table D3, which is the in-depth or expansion table for the access control family. This is a portion of table D3, for the access control family. Here we see the expansion of AC2, 
including the name of each subcontrol. We just saw them called out in the last slide, and here you see the greater detail on the subcontrols to be, to be implemented for moderate and high potential impact systems. You may want to spend a little time with the upcoming three reference slides, which show how the descriptions of AC1 and AC2 are presented in Appendix F. The selection of the requisite security controls completes step two of the RMF. We won't go into steps three through six. Just note how you then implement and assess the controls, have the system authorized, and then go into the operational period and continuous monitoring. FedRAMP provides a standardized approach to securing cloud products and services for a government customer. While it uses 853 as the basis for controls for low and moderate impact systems, it calls out a number of additional controls. At some point, FedRAMP may offer a high impact system. There's more about this on the Solutions Reservoir website. A feature of FedRAMP certification is the controls assessment, RMF Step 4, by an approved third party called a 3PAO. Step 5, authorization, is provided by the FedRAMP jab, although many suppliers have received a more narrow authorization directly from an agency. FedRAMP calls for a continuous monitoring program, which you may recall is RMF Step 6. Some years ago, reacting to the manner in which government agencies were procuring internet access, the OMB developed the TIC initiative, which included an expanded role for US CERT. DHS developed a reference architecture for trusted internet access, envisioning three ways to obtain it. A, a large agency could develop and operate its own TIC, which involves a SOC and all the cybersecurity controls discussed in Part 1 and here in Part 2. A small agency could procure access through a larger agency's TIC, or any agency could procure a managed security service, usually called MTIPS, from a small set of GSA authorized providers. From the DHS reference architecture document, we observe the three means to obtain a TIC, the single and multi-service tie caps, and the service-based options MTIPS. Note the explicit callout of Einstein, the NCPS, National Cybersecurity Protection Systems, which provides IDPS for federal departments and agencies. Here's a yellow background if you want to study this diagram. Recapping, we've looked at FISMA under which security objectives for information and information systems were defined. We've noted some key organizations, notably DHS, US CERT, and NIST. After introducing some of NIST's cybersecurity standards, we covered FIPS 199, 200, and especially NIST SB-853 in some detail. We concluded with introductions to FedRAMP and trusted internet connections. In part three, we'll look at cybersecurity and national security systems of which DOD systems are a part. There's more information on the Solutions Reservoir website. So see you in part three.